Welcome everybody. Maybe we can just start, now we've done the prayers, we can just sit quietly for a couple minutes together. Okay. Do I need any kind of microphone or will it pick up? Let's pick up. Oh, I see that. That is the microphone. I see. Okay. Again, welcome. Uh, as you see, I'm a bit incapacitated at the moment. Uh, it's nothing serious, but I've been uh, I've been out of the country for a while, and so I came back and had the opportunity to use a treadmill for the first time in years. And, uh, at first, it went very well. It was nice to be uh, jogging again, something we don't get the opportunity to, to do in our monastery. But after about six or seven days, I uh, started to uh, notice some, some pain in the knee and didn't pay enough attention to it. So now it's gotten uh, a bit more uh, serious. So I have to rest for a few days, the doctor said. Um, but uh, it's a good opportunity, I think. Uh, actually, I turned 40 this past year. so starting to get some opportunities to experience old age. Let's see how it's, it's slowly coming. It's good to know that we are reminded that it's, uh, it's always looming in the, in the future. It gets closer all the time. I first came here to Kurukula Center when I was 19. In the, the first year they bought the center here. I remember coming here and knocking down the walls. It's nice always to be back here. I've been out of the country now for 17 years, but I, I come back every five years approximately. So I was here five years ago, gave a few teachings. So today, um, yeah, one student had requested some talks on refuge and bodhisattva vows, which I thought was a good topic. Generally, I try to teach a little bit about what I've been studying in the monastery. Um, I think you might know, but just, I've been in a Sara monastery since I've been in India, which is in South India. Uh, Sara was founded in 1419 in Tibet, but was uh, 
then forced into exile and is reestablished in South India in 1970. So I've been there since 2006. Um, so the past few years, I've been studying Madhyamaka philosophy, emptiness. So I've been giving a lot of talks on that. But now we started Vinaya, which is a monastic discipline, which is maybe a little bit more difficult to, uh, to give introductory talks. That's probably something that if I talked about what we studied this year, it seemed uh, rather dry and academic. But at the same time, uh, I found it very accessible, more so than I expected and from what people said. A lot of it's very relevant. And so certainly what I can share here is about the refuge and the bodhisattva vows, which are relevant to anybody. You don't have to be a monk to find these relevant, but maybe occasionally I'll bring in some points from the Vinaya, which might seem relevant, which might be interesting. Um, and of course, to remember that the, the refuge vows themselves, the, the, the opasika, the um, lay follower vows, are then are also part of the party moksha, the individual liberation vows. It's not just monastic vows, um, even though it just takes a lot longer to study because there's so many more of those vows and so many more details of monastic life. But the party moksha vow includes the, the five lay vows, which is mainly what we'll be talking about this morning. So I had some notes about what to say. So I thought I would start by talking a little bit about refuge. Because, of course, this, is, this goes together. We have the ref, taking refuge and then taking the, the lay vows. Um, and so first to talk about what, what is refuge. So, of course, the word refuge in English, actually, I didn't think to check the etymology. I ought to have done that. But um, I suppose in English, we have it must be something about huge. Does anybody know? Re, huge, nobody knows where that comes from. In English, uh, sorry, in, in Tibetan, we have the word kyap. So kyap is sort of something that, that saves you. So the word kyo, it's related to the, 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 um, the verb kyo, which means to save somebody. And then kyap is an, a, something that you go to to be saved. So there's a commonly cited passage from the sutra that talks about people, when they're afraid, uh, they go for refuge to various things. So for example, some people take refuge in the forest. They're afraid of the king, so they hide in the forest. And some people hide out in the mountains and, and so forth. But it says this is not the main refuge. It's not the best refuge. The being, point being that it can only temporarily free you from certain level of suffering. If you want to be free from all suffering in a stable way, then there's a, a better refuge. So this is talking about the Buddhist refuge, which is the, the three jewels of refuge, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Uh, so it's understood that by going to refuge for these, uh, we can find some kind of more stable uh, happiness and some more stable, um, you know, saving us from our what we're afraid of. So then, of course, it's not just fr fear of, of, it says in the sutra, the king. I mean, nowadays, that's probably not something most people are very afraid of, but um, all kinds of things. We might be afraid of gun violence or uh, of... Um, you know, of our people and our uh, superiors in our work environment, our boss, somebody who might have the power to affect our lives in a, in a difficult way. So we seek some kind of refuge from that. Um, so there's all kinds of different refuges. We can see medicine uh, for ref as refuge from an illness. Uh, but here we have to recognize what kind of suffering we're talking about. So uh, as many of you might know, in Buddhism, we don't talk about just suffering at the gross level. It's not, uh, you know, we, we're more pessimistic than that. We talk a lot about a lot of different levels of suffering. So we have what we call suffering of suffering, which is the, the normal everyday suffering, what we usually, when we use the word suffering, um, that is like you know, being pricked by a pin or any kind of physical pain or also mental pain, mental dis uh, discomfort. That's all suffering of suffering, which is synonymous with a suffering sensation. So actually, the suffering of suffering is synonymous with, with suffering in a general sense. Um, but in, it's, it, it's a bit difficult in English because we have only one word, suffering. But in Tibetan, there's a very subtle difference. There's suffering, dugngyel, and there's suffering, what I might call suffering nis, dugngyel wa, which is something that's in the nature of suffering. So only this physical you know, pinprick, that's, that's actual suffering, 
But then also we have what we call suffering of change and suffering of, of pervasive compounded suffering. And these are not suffering in the sense of they're not physical, they're not, they're not an experience of suffering or sensation of suffering, but they're in the nature of suffering, uh, which means that they're under the control of uh, karma and delusion. That's what, how we define something being in the nature of suffering. So the suffering of change uh, is what we usually call a uh, feeling of happiness. So it's the opposite. So uh, any kind of physical sensation of happiness, the common example that's given is eating some um, tasty food. Uh, that's considered the suffering of change because if you, the more you eat, it doesn't just become happier and happier. Eventually you start feeling uncomfortable. And two hours later, you don't still feel happy. You might think back, oh, what a wonderful meal. Uh, so that you might have some residual mental happiness, but in the long run, it actually just turns to more suffering. Uh, because uh, there's the, the, as I say, the keep, you keep eating, you feel less comfortable. Uh, after eating, you have digestive experiences, which are generally not pleasant. And uh, in the long run, you just want to eat again, because it doesn't really satisfy your hunger. So in that sense, it just creates the causes for more suffering. Uh, somebody who has never had excellent food, and then doesn't have it again, the next day won't really care. But somebody who has had excellent food every day of their life, if they're deprived of it for a week, will probably suffer a lot as a result. So it only led, leads to more suffering. And then there's what we, the third one we call pervasive compounded suffering, uh, which is kind of the basis for both of those. It's showing that there's a reason this whole situation is happening. It's not just, um, you know, it's not just how things are in that sense that um, is unchangeable. Um, and it's also not just a something that we can change in a coarse way that, oh, if we just take the right medicine or we just you know, get the right therapy, then that'll go away because it'll, it's some, you know, some sort of coarse thing. It's a very subtle thing, uh, which has to do pervasive compounded suffering. So the word pervasive means that it pervades all, uh, all things in ordinary existence. So our physical body, our normal everyday experiences, our mental state, and also the physical objects around us are all pervasive compounded suffering. Uh, and compounded or compounding in the sense that uh, they are under the control of karma and delusion, what I talked about before. Uh, and then suffering in the sense that in the nature of suffering, it's not a suffering sensation. Of course, the table in front of me is not a su suffering sensation. It's not a mental state at all, but it's a, um, uh, it's in the nature of suffering. So everything that we experience uh, comes about uh, conditioned through past karma and delusion. The world system we experience arises due to the karma of beings. This is a very complex topic, which I would be very happy to talk about more, but unfortunately we don't have a lot of time today that I can talk that I can go on to these tangents. But that's something that uh, certainly is worth examining. In Buddhism, nothing is meant to be taken on faith. This is a very important point. Uh, this isn't just something that we believe. It's really to understand what the Buddha was saying when he made the, when he gave this very clear teaching, um, and try to see is it is it true? Does it? There could be a lot of reasons we might say that doesn't make any sense. Uh, we might think that how could everything arise from karma when it arises from uh, physical atoms and the interactions of subtle particles? Well, that might seem to be incongruent. So it's very important to think about those things. Um, and if anyone has questions at the end, I could maybe recommend further avenues of, of looking into that. But the point here is that we want to recognize all of those things and recognize we want to be free of it. So it's not just, I want to be free of uh, the original thing. I said the fear of the king. I want to be free of, um, you know, I'm afraid of some particular person or some particular situation that makes me uncomfortable. And I want to be free of that. So I go for refuge to the Buddha and pray, please, please take this away from me. Um, some of you might know the story in the Buddha's lifetime when one woman came to him who had her baby had died. And she asked him, uh, can you please bring my baby back to life? And the Buddha said, yes, just all you have to do is bring me a mustard seed from the house of a family that's never experienced death. So she became very excited and searched around. But of course, eventually she discovered she couldn't find such a thing. And this became a teaching for her that 
uh, there is no such thing as a family who's never experienced death. And that helped her to see more deeply that it doesn't, the ref refuge in the Buddha doesn't mean that the Buddha just saves you from all the things that are making you unhappy at the moment. Uh, that would be, you know, in some sense, a, a very dishonest religion. If it said bad things don't happen to good people and you go for refuge to me and you're never going to suffer again in your life. But it's recognizing more deeply, why are we in this situation in the first place? Why are we in this situation that, for one thing, when people die, we experience it as so discomfort, as so uncomfortable. And even more deeply, why are we in the situation in the first place? Why are we born into the situation where people die, where we have to experience getting older and getting sick and dying? Uh, so that's what we want to ultimately be free of, free of. And that's what the Buddha said he can free us from. Not that he comes and frees us with his hands, but through practicing his teachings, it is possible to be free of that. That's actually a lot more radical than saying, I'd like to be free of uh, everyday uh, minor things. Um, but it's said to be more realistic. It's not realistic to think I'm not going to get old, but it is realistic to think I might, I could not be born again if I really uh, practice sincerely. Uh, so that's something, again, uh, that we uh, have to think about. But uh, kind of moving on from that, so what do we go for refuge to? When we talk about refuge, the first thing is recognizing the object. So we have the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Um, so we say the Buddha, it can, be, it can mean a couple of different things. Uh, I know in some Buddhist traditions, they say when we say the Buddha, we mean the historical person of the Buddha. But if we're coming at this from the Mahayana approach, it's a little different. And I'll talk about that more in the afternoon when we talk about the Bodhisattva vows. It's understood that the Buddha is more than just one person. It, it, there's, there's many Buddhas. It's anybody who is an enlightened being. And more so than that, there's what we call the causal refuge and the resultant refuge. Uh, so. The causal refuge is the Buddha who was enlightened in the past, who helps to be a cause for us to be enlightened ourselves. The resultant refuge is the Buddha that we ourselves will be in the future. And that's actually the more important refuge. When we say, I go for refuge to the Buddha, ultimately what we're doing is saying, I go for refuge to becoming a Buddha, such that when I become a Buddha, I will be free of all the suffering. Um, and then... Um, Within that, then we have, different, in, in Mahayana, we talk about all different divisions of the Buddha and the Buddha bodies, um, which I think maybe we won't talk about too much now. But the main thing we try to change is our minds. You know, it's, the Buddha supposedly has a very different body also. Um, I talked about things being in the nature of suffering. One ex exception to that is the body of the Buddha. It's not actually in the nature of suffering, and it's not arisen through karma and delusion. It's a different essence than most physical things. But that is because of the mind. It's not that you can just change your body and run in a treadmill and, and become a Buddha, as I discovered. Um, but it's that uh, you, you change your mind. And when your mind changes, eventually it will have physical ramifications as well. But that's, that's uh, less, of an, less important than changing the mind. Um, and then we have the, the Dharma. And the Dharma is the main refuge, it said, that the Buddha is the teacher, the Sangha, which I'll get to, is the helpers, and the, but the Dharma is the real refuge, it's what actually frees us. And so some people think when we say, I go for refuge to the Dharma, we're saying, I go for refuge to the teachings, which is not actually quite the case. Um, we say that the teachings, the different scriptural teachings of the Buddha uh, and their commentaries, these are called the provisional uh, Dharma Refuge, but not the actual Dharma Refuge. The actual Dharma Refuge, uh, if you know the Four Noble Truths, it's the truth of cessation and the truth of the path. Because that is really what frees us from suffering. It's if we can generate the truth of the path in our continuum, that it becomes the direct antidote to delusion, which is the cause of suffering, and then achieve the freedom from delusion, which is the truth of cessation. So right there, it's really talking about the resultant refuge. I say, I go for refuge to the Dharma, it's saying, I go for refuge to achieving truth of the path and the truth of cessation, 
rather than going for aiming for something that isn't really going to free me from suffering. So in the meantime, I might take medicine or do other things that will give me some kind of temporary, um, something I need in order to survive and keep practicing. But my real goal uh, is to uh, achieve cessation, cessation of delusion. And when I achieve that, uh, then there'll be no more suffering. Uh, so that is when I go for refuge of the Dharma, uh, it's putting, you know, as actually one uh, Western teacher, Alex Burson, some of you might know, I like his uh, translation. He says, safe direction. It's not really a correct translation, but it's a good emphasis of what this means. So I'm, take, I'm directing that way. It's not like a refuge that I'm going to hide myself in this, but I'm going to uh, aim for that. So I'm going to aim for the truth of cessation and make that the purpose of my life. That's going for refuge to the Dharma. And then finally, the Sangha. Uh, again, provisionally, uh, we can say that the Sangha is monks and nuns. Um, but again, that's, that's only kind of what, uh, what uh, exemplifies or show, has like an example of the Sangha in the world because we can't necessarily see the actual Sangha right now. But it's not the real Sangha. The real Sangha is beings who have generated these things, the truth of the path and the truth of cessation. And somebody becomes an actual Sangha refuge, um, which means an Arya being, we call it, as a Sanskrit word. So going for refuge to them, as I said before, is uh, as the helper. That these are people who can help us in a very uh, serious way in terms of developing these qualities. And because the Buddha might be less accessible, whereas some people who are at different stages of the path uh, can be more accessible to us immediately. Um, and again, this has the, the causal refuge, which is people who have already achieved that state, and then the resultant, which is uh, the own state, actual stages that we ourselves will achieve uh, as we go along the path. So those are the objects of refuge. Uh, and I just wanted also to mention, you know, when we think about these objects, as I mentioned before, but everything needs to be approached uh, with reasoning and not just taken on faith. So as a couple of examples of that, uh, we have, I mean, you might know Tsongkhapa was the founder of our school of Buddhism, the Gelug School. And one of his main students, Kedrup J, Kedrup Gelek Pelzong, uh, in one of his texts, he talks about how if you, if you have a valid cognizer, meaning you have, you've used reason to establish uh, certainty for yourself, that there really is such a thing as these three jewels of refuge, then when you go for refuge, it is very forceful. It has the power to, he says, to, um, to overturn the mountain of cyclic existence. But if you do so uh, only uh, by just saying the words, I go for refuge, and without under, really understanding what you're going for refuge to, there's very little benefit in that. There's some benefit in that you're, it's much better than going to refuge to some kind of negative thing. Uh, and there's some blessing, it said, in, in the words even. Um, but uh, that's not very stable in the long run. And then another example more recently is His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who certainly takes this approach of we need to use reasoning. Uh, so he has one uh, prayer he composed, uh, the prayer to the 17 Panditas, uh, Nalanda Masters of India. So in this prayer, he says, um, I'll say it in Tibetan first, it helps me. So, Deni Netsu Deni Lektok Ne, Den Shikor Jukon Jijin Ne, Deme Trampe Kepsun Depat Den, Tarlam Sawat Super Jingi Lob. So this is saying, uh, please bless me that I may assert, gain stable ascertainment of the two truths, which is conventional ultimate truth. And through that, then come to understand the Four Noble Truths and the way that we uh, enter into samsara and the way of being free from that. Such from that, induced by valid cognition, um, may I have stable faith in the three jewels that become and therefore plant the root that uh, that leads to liberation. Uh, so His Holiness is saying that we need to, uh, it's not just about going for refuge and uh, having an emotional feeling. It's about really examining very closely what the teachings are talking about to the point where you gain a stable ascertainment. This is one uh, synonym for stable, the word that we use in Tibetan Dempa. It's talking about, it says milua, which means incontrovertible, meaning that 
if, the, if you have an incontrovertible certainty in something, then nobody can sway your mind otherwise. Because you've come to this, re this certainty yourself. It's not just because somebody else said it and I believe it. Uh, it's because I understand myself through my own um, examination. So no matter what somebody says, oh, you're wrong, well, I know that I'm right. Uh, so that's, that's what we want to uh, really cultivate. Uh, so then we have, when we go for refuge, what is uh, the basis for the refuge? So what I mean by that uh, is the cause. The so cause for going for refuge, I referenced it a bit earlier, is normally said to be twofold. It's uh, fear and faith. So fear means fear of suffering. So this isn't like a paralyzing fear. It's, it's a recognition of the truth of things. That I don't, there, first of all, that I have to experience suffering as long as I'm born, as long as I'm in this, uh, this conditioned existence, and recognizing that's not desirable. I don't want to have that experience again and again. Uh, it's not that I have to shy away from it. It's not that I have to hide every time uh, I, I have something difficult in my life. But in the long run, this is not a desirable situation. Uh, and to recognize that, the more deeply we have that, the stronger the refuge will be. Uh, and then faith is then uh, faith that the three drills have the power to free us from that. Um, and then sometimes it's talked about also a third cause, which is compassion. This has to do with the Mahayana understanding of refuge, that it's not just about my own being free of suffering, it's about wanting to be able to free others of that too. And then likewise recognizing that at a very deep level, in order to really help others, I have to have some method to do so. It's not enough just to go out and say, I'm going to help. Uh, we have to have something to offer. And so recognizing that going for refuge and cultivating uh, the path then eventually will allow us to uh, achieve something that will allow us to help others and teach others. So then we can go for refuge also with the motivation of compassion. So next we have, uh, we say the uh, the nature. So what is the, uh, what is refuge? When we say go for refuge, actually, you might think I'm going to say it's a mental state. It's usually presented in the text as speech. That the real refuge, it's not that the refuge is speech, but going for refuge uh, is an act of speech. Um, that's the main thing, is when I perform the refuge ceremony and I say, I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go for refuge to the Dharma, I go for refuge to the Sangha, that speech is going for refuge. Now, if I just say the words with no, without the proper understanding, then that's different. It doesn't, it's not just the words themselves, but uh, the actual going for refuge is reciting that. Uh, that formula um, with uh, the right motivation, so with the right understanding. But also it's understood that the physical action, so like making prostrations, and of course the mental action of having refuge, that is also re a going for refuge. But it said mainly it, it, it's the speech in the sense that to receive refuge, to receive refuge of vows, uh, we have to go through the ritual. Um, it's not, it's very helpful um, you know, to cultivate this mind mental state ourselves. But uh, in Buddhism, there's a lot of emphasis placed upon uh, being part of a community. And so joining a community and then sort of, um, you say, uh, you know, committing oneself in this way, in this formal way to that, so that becomes the act of, of going for refuge. Now, of course, if somebody is unable to speak, I wonder what happens. It's the kinds of things we debate. <laughs> uh, so probably we could say, well, you could have sign language or some other substitute. Um, but the main point is that it has to be communicated that we see the, fir the very first uh, students of the Buddha, these five disciples that he first taught, uh, they said to him, we, we go for refuge to you. And they communicated their intention to follow his teachings. Um, so then we have, uh, we talk about the, the cause in the sense of uh, this is this is pretty straightforward, but kind of what kind of body, first of all, one has to have. So in this, it's said in the Buddhist teachings that it can be anything. So you, one could be a human being, or an animal, or a ghost, or a god. In Buddhism, we have lots of different classes of beings. I don't think it's saying dogs can go for refuge, uh, because uh, they probably wouldn't understand what they're doing. Usually when it, we have to look at what they're referring to, probably when they say, 
animals, they're referring to what Buddhists call nagas, which is a special kind of animal that's supposed to be very intelligent. So I don't know, I've never seen a naga. I don't know if they really exist, but uh, if they do, the understanding here is that that's one example of some another kind of being that can go for refuge. So humans or animals or hungry ghosts or gods. Uh, and then what kind of uh, mind one has to have? It has to be that one has, as I said before, the mind of fear, and then the um, knowing what the object of refuge is. So if you don't know what the object of refuge is, then you don't really receive refuge vows, even if you recite the formula. And then thirdly, the cause is the, the ritual again. So it has to be adopted in this kind of ritual. And as I'll say in the afternoon, the bodhisattva vows, if there's permission to take them from a statue, if one doesn't have a proper master, but with refuge vows, it's understood that it's only possible to take them uh, from a teacher, which is, again, the emphasis I hear is on lineage. In Buddhism, this is very important. Um, there's an understanding that, um, of course, one has to use reasoning oneself. It's not just about believing in the lineage, but at the same time, uh, there's a special force that comes uh, through a, con a continuity of practitioners. Uh, and so it's not just a matter of, of words, it's a matter of being around somebody who has some kind of realization. We want to have that ourselves. If we just read a book about it, uh, well, that can be beneficial in a, in, to a certain extent. It's very possible to get a lot of wrong ideas, even if we think we understand. It's very important to be both with people who are more advanced than us, but also with other practitioners who are practicing with us, kind of helping us to, um, you know, to see our own misunderstandings and just see in the, say, in the flesh, somebody who's practiced this and what is the result of that. Um, also, there's it's a bit of a tangential point, but I'll just mention we talk about uh, some other kinds of uh, causes that can happen. So, um, in some more detailed text, like you might, I think it's Fury the Lamrim Chemo by some couple to talk about this, um, like different kinds of causes or powers. So, like we have the, the causal power versus the power of effort. So, what the causal power means is talking about if somebody has take, gone for refuge in a past life. Uh, and then they encounter Buddhism again in this life, they'll have a very strong natural sense of refuge. Now, it's interesting, that's actually said to be more stable than somebody who makes effort and re develops refuge. So it might seem uh, like uh, a little unfair that the person who makes effort, <laughs> uh, but this is understood to be psychologically what happens. And of course, the person, the first person would have made effort in a past life, but it's understood that this, this is something that develops over many lifetimes. And the more one practices it, then in the future life, it becomes much more natural. Uh, whereas in this life, if somebody has never encountered Buddhism before, and they practice uh, uh, just for the first time, something can happen. But in a lot of ways, they can still have a lot of kind of intellectual understanding that doesn't, you can see, isn't quite in hit, hitting their heart yet, or that there's just you know, some very simple point, sort of subtle point, I might say, but seemingly simple, where they just don't quite understand it the way that it's generally understood uh, among, in the tradition and among other practitioners. Um, and this is understood to be uh, the result of karma. Uh, so as I said before, that's something to just, you know, to think about and to be aware of. It's not something that the text said this and therefore it's true, but to, to look at that and to look at our own you know, other practitioners and, and see, not in a judgmental way, but to look at other people we know and think about, you know, what, what could be happening and sort of, sometimes it's said in the text that we have certain phenomena that are called very subtle, meaning that very hidden, meaning that they can't be understood uh, without the help of the textual system. But that doesn't mean that they're completely inaccessible all of the time. Sometimes it means that you know, the book might say something that helps us think about it in a different way. And then we have to apply our own reasoning. But if somebody had never just gave it, given that idea, for example, the Four Noble Truths, the Four Noble Truths are not meant to, not understood to be very hidden. It's something that we can understand the reasoning, but it's very unlikely that somebody who never received a teaching before on Buddhism will just come up with an understanding of the Four Noble Truths on their own. And it's somebody has to kind of point them in that direction. So likewise, with this idea of, of the different causes, we have, it's good that we can think about it.
So that is about the, the, the first of all, going for refuge and the objects of refuge. Uh, so next we have, when somebody goes for refuge, um, we have, first of all, the vows that some of you might know. Really, the word vow uh, is not quite the right translation. In Tibetan, the word is dompa, which means for strength. Um, and then in English, it's often translated as vow, but uh, in Tibetan, we don't really use that word. We say when somebody takes, you know, it's not, the restraint is understood to be something you've committed to. In that sense, it is a vow, but we don't refer to them as vows. It's something that we, we restrain ourselves from certain behaviors. But before we get to the, the vows or the restraints, um, we have what's called the advice, which is more general. It's not like you, if you go against this, um, you're breaking a vow per se, but it's advice on how to behave. Uh, as a Buddhist, when somebody has taken refuge, they're formerly a Buddhist. So we have, first of all, um, advice as to what to adopt and then what to avoid. So what to adopt, we have uh, in terms of each of the three jewels individually. So when one has gone for refuge to the Buddha, uh, then the advice is to, when one sees any statue of the Buddha, representation of the Buddha, to regard it as an actual Buddha and make offerings and prostrations. Uh, this helps us to maintain a particular uh, discriminating factor, we say. That it's, of course, it's not real in the sense this is not a, a physical human being. We don't have to necessarily believe that. Um, but it's like when we, when somebody is an actor, we view them as a particular, as this person. And the more we believe that to be the case, the more real this, this film becomes for us. If we just keep thinking, oh, it's just an actor, it's not real, you won't really get much out of watching the movie. So likewise, if as a Buddhist, we regard representations of the Buddha or of Buddhas as actual Buddhas, that will affect how we experience them. And that will allow us to experience it as if the Buddha is right here with us, as opposed to some distant person who lived far in the past. And likewise, with the Dharma, it's to, res to re regard the scriptural text, so a physical text, as the actual Dharma, or is it even a single syllable? So if you see a page of the Dharma on the floor, to pick it up and put it back on the shelf, uh, to regard that as represent representing the actual Dharma, uh, which, as I said before, is really the, the truth of cessation, the truth of the path. But that's not something we can point to in the world. So and a representation of that for us is to regard the, the text of the actual Dharma. And then thirdly, uh, for the Sangha, is to regard anyone who's wearing monastic robes as the actual Sangha. So as I said before, the, a monk or a nun is not really the Sangha uh, in the sense that they're not a, an Arya being. They could be, but probably not. And an Arya being could be a lay person as well. But provisionally, to regard them uh, as uh, actual Sangha. And so in Buddhist practice, it's very important as Buddhists um, you know, to regard monks and nuns with a lot of respect. Now, I don't say you have to regard me with respect per se, but um, I try to think a bit of people show me respect that is not me personally, it's the vows that I'm holding, that I have taken vows that come from a continuity from the Buddha. And so I have a big responsibility and I'm wearing robes that represent that. And so uh, also personally, I have to be very respectful of my robes. For example, when I put them on, I don't step into them. I have to put them over my head because I see this as representing uh, something that's much greater than myself. Uh, so, uh, you know, as Buddhists, it's very good if we can, uh, when we have monks and nuns uh, in our community, to treat them with a lot of respect and treat them as um, sort of some hierarchy that they, uh, they are allowed to sit in front and to be served first and things like that. Uh, that allows us, you know, to develop uh, a lot of, you know, first of all, diminish pride, but then to, um, have respect and venerate, you know, a veneration for the Buddha uh, and his students, uh, and see that as representing the actual Sangha. We have to know that's not the real Sangha, that this person, we don't want to be delusional and think, oh, this is an enlightened being. It, it very well might not be, but to, to act as if that's the case, to see this, as I said before, like a discriminating factor. We see somebody, they're playing that part, and because they're playing that part, I'm going to respect that because I respect what they're trying to represent. Um, so it said anyone who's wearing even a monastic robe. Now I wonder if somebody is a fake, you know, if we know that they're fake and they're just wearing monastic robes, I don't know if we have to necessarily venerate them in that way. 
Um, but I think the point is that you know when somebody uh, you know, has the robes, and you know, unless unless we know for certain that they're not you know authentic, then we uh, we respect that. Uh, so next we have uh, the say it's the different benefits of going for refuge. It's usually described when we talk about refuge. So there are traditionally eight that are listed, sometimes seven. So we have um, that you become a Buddhist. If you're a, if you go for refuge, then you're officially a Buddhist. We could say, if you've um, you've fit fil- the definition of what it means to be a Buddhist. And then secondly, that you become a basis for vows. So based on refuge, then you can take lay vows or you can take monastic vows. Um, and then thirdly, that uh, you will extinguish or exhaust previously accumulated and negative karma. So as long as you have refuge in a continuum, then continuously with the re- mindfulness of that, keeping that in memory, uh, then past, past accumulated negative karma will slowly uh, exhaust itself. And fourth, you will not fall to lower realms, which is saying that if you go for refuge, uh, you will not be born in an unfortunate migration. Now, with everything, there's there can be exceptions. It's not saying, unfortunately, that somebody who goes for refuge is automatically exempt from all of this, but it's generally saying that this is a strong force that helps us because at the time of death, when you have uh, what thoughts you have at the time of death will strongly condition what karma ripens. And so if you have a thought of refuge, it can, it can strongly prevent negative karma from ripening in a way that will cause us to be born in a place where we have no opportunity to practice, which is really the main problem with these unfortunate migrations. Um, and then it says that you won't be, you will be in, uh, say impenetrable or invincible to harm. So that I wonder, <laughs> it's certainly not saying, as I said before, it's not that if you go for refuge to the Buddha, that you're therefore not going to die. Um, but it's saying perhaps at a certain level that it it does protect you. There is some protection in having this this mental state. Um, that it there's there's some ability to affect what karma ripens. Lama Zopra Rinpoche often says that we're 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 dealing with conditions here. Of course, the main cause of experiencing suffering is the karma created in the past. And just going for refuge doesn't erase that. But what conditions we have in the present time can affect what karma ripens. So one example of that that's talked about in the Lamrim is not avoiding fear. So for example, if I have the karma to fall off a cliff, if I go bungee jumping, it's much more likely that karma is going to ripen. This is why we don't just do things as Buddhists, it's good not to, not to take unnecessary risks because we're putting, we're make, given the opportunity for whatever karma might ripen. When we go for refuge, we're creating a condition that can help stop certain karmas from ripening. Uh, it may not, you know, if something's very strong, again, Lama Zebra Fiche, he gave this example when he talked in our house a few years ago, when Mbrije visited us at Sarah, and he said that when he was a young boy, uh, he, was, uh, he was living in Nepal at the time, he'd never met any Westerners. So he said his first encounter was with some rich Western ladies who seemed very uh, dissatisfied with everything, I mean, nothing was good enough. And so he said he went into his room to his altar and prayed, may I never, never be born in the West. <laughs> yeah. And then I, I think he said, well, never, may I never go to the West. Because then his, his attendant, Venerable Roger, was right there with us. And Roger made the very good point right away. He said, well, Rinpoche, in the light of him having traveled in the West most of his life, he said, well, Rinpoche, that doesn't give us much faith in the power of prayer. <laughs> and Rinpoche said, no, 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 because the karma to go to the West was much, much stronger than the prayer. So that's the point here, that sometimes if the karma is very strong, and if the prayer is not very strong, then, then it can override that. It's not that we're just invincible. Uh, but there is perhaps you know, some benefit in the, in the short run, or at least that if things ripen, they ripen in a way that allows us to develop. That we experience suffering in a way that allows us to learn from it, rather than it just being so oppressive or overwhelming that we can't develop any further, or that we're born in a place where we can't continue practicing. Um, Okay, and then we have... 
Oh yeah, uh, that you will achieve your aims. So again, this isn't a guarantee, but that uh, certain things, if you uh, aspire to do them and you go for refuge to the three jewels, then it will make it more likely that you'll be able to succeed in what you're doing. Um, and then uh, uh, also that you will quickly uh, be achieve the state of a Buddha. This is the, perhaps the most important one that as we go for refuge, uh, it creates the causes for us to uh, create to become a Buddha, to plant the seed of that. So I think that I give eight. I think I may be missing one, but I think that's okay for now. So these are the ways say the different benefits of going for refuge. And then we have um, so I'll, I'll now shift. As I said, we were going to talk about vows uh, or restraints, uh, which will constitute most of the rest of the talk. So when somebody takes uh, refuge and then takes lay vows, we call upasika upasika in, in, actually in Sanskrit. Um, that's female, male and female lay followers. Uh, so those are two. We say there's, there are actually eight uh, kinds of pratimoksha vows. The word pratimoksha in Sanskrit means individual liberation. Uh, so, in the sense that uh, it, if I go for refuge and I follow the, these these practices, I will be liberated. It's not going to cause somebody else to be liberated. It's, in, it's an individual practice. That's one way to understand it. And so, uh, there there are upasika and upasika, which are male and female lay followers. Uh, and then, just briefly, we also have um, what's called nyanye uh, in Tibetan, which Upa, upavasa, I think it's Sanskrit, which means near abiding, which is one day vows. And I'll talk about that a little later also. This is something that lay people can also take. Uh, and then we have, um, uh, so getsu getsuma, which is shramanera, I believe in Sanskrit. These are novice, monk, and nun. And then we have uh, gelopma, which I forget the Sanskrit. That That is a another step for a nun. Which, it's like a, a probationary nun, I think they call it. And then we have Gelong and Geloma, so uh, Bhikshu and Bhikshuni, fully ordained monks and nuns. So those are the eight uh, kinds of vows that we can take with the party moksha. So as lay people, mainly we take the, the uh, Upasika Apasika, which are identical. Uh, for the monks and nuns, it's a little different. A fully ordained monk and fully ordained nun have some differences in their vows. Uh, but for lay people, um, males and females, it's, it's the same vows. And then within lay vows, we'd also talk about seven different ways we can take them. Uh, there's some dispute about this, actually, whether all of them are, are really uh, authentically lay vows. So the first one would be merely going for refuge, that somebody is not willing to take on any of the five precepts, but they merely go for refuge. And then secondly, that one, somebody takes one of them. Uh, so uh, I think most of you know, but we say there's uh, Killing, or not to kill, not to steal, not to commit sexual misconduct, not to lie, and not to uh, take intoxicants. So if you feel, okay, I can only commit to not stealing, then you just take that one vow. And then somebody who takes two of them. Uh, and then somebody who takes, it says most of them, which means three or four. Then somebody who takes all five of them. And then somebody who takes all five of them, and on top of that, commits cel celibacy for life. So that's called a, a sanctrugini, which means brahmacharya. Brahmacharya in Sanskrit is um, a pure behavior, which means celibacy. So somebody can be a lay person, uh, which means they don't have monastic vows, but they still commit to celibacy. And then we also have what we call gomi ganyan in Tibetan. So gomi is Sanskrit. Uh, so it would be gomi upasaka, I suppose. So this uh, is said that somebody takes, not only that they take all of the, um, and the celibacy and so forth, they take the eight vows that somebody takes for one day, which means they vow not to wear ornaments, they wear, vow not to uh, sit on high seats, not to eat in the evening, which are very similar to monastic vows. Um, and they take that for life, and they actually wear monastic robes, but they're still a lay person. But it's it said that this, this is actually a teacher said this, a teacher who brought Buddhism to Tibet, um, he said that uh, 
this, this tradition existed in the Mahasamgika school, which he belonged to in terms of uh, monastic vows. But the Molasavastyavardhan tradition, which is what we follow in Tibetan, in terms of our Prati Moksha vow, does not have that. So actually, Tibetans don't have that tradition of taking this Gomi uh, vow. Um, so what, as I said, we have those seven, but a lot of schools of thought say that the first ones are not actual legitimate vows. Take one, or take zero, one, two, three, or four. Because when somebody takes uh, any vow, it said that at the time of taking the vow, you have to be free of the five discriminations, which is free of discrimination in relation to sentient being, uh, to um, branch, place, time, and period. So that would be saying, for sentient being, it would be like, I'm not going to kill except this person. So then it's, you're, you're discriminating one, you're leaving one out. And then for place, it would be, for example, this could be for a monk. I, I'm going to be a monk when I live in the monastery, but when I go back to my country, I'm going to act like a lay person again. Or uh, time is I'm going to take these vows for 10 days, but after that, I'm going to give them up. Uh, and then period is sort of similar, but it's like, as long as there's peace in the world, I'm going to keep these vows. But if there's a war, I'm going to fight and I'm going to kill people. Uh, and then finally, branch, which is saying that I'm going to take some of the vows, but not all of them. So it said if you have any of those discriminations, then you don't receive the vow. So a lot of people argue that you can't really have the vow where you only take a few of them. You have to take all five of them. And they say that when it's said that there are people who have only two or three vows, it's because they took all five but two of them degenerated, they lost them, uh, but they still have three left. But in practice, as I understand, there are people uh, who take uh, one or two or three in the Tibetan tradition, it seems. So there seems to be some allowance for that. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama has even mentioned that. And when he gets vows, he talks about, um, you know, for example, the vow of intoxicants. Uh, he says, if you can't give up alcohol entirely, as long as you don't uh, become drunk, then that's okay. Uh, but uh, you know, if you follow the vow strictly, it's quite clear that uh, you shouldn't have any alcohol, which I'll talk about. Um, so I think yeah, that's something to examine. We, you know, to be honest, honestly, it's hard for me to know. Uh, we haven't. These are the kind of things that we debate uh, and we study Vinaya. We try to get into the, all the details of these, um, but at this point, uh, I don't know. Uh, where the tradition comes from, because as I said, in our traditional Tibetan text, it's pretty clear that you can't do that. You can't take one vow. But then in practice today, it does seem that people are doing that. They must have some some source for that understanding. And it's said in the, actually, I should just mention in the text that other schools do accept that. So it says like Asanga, one of the great Indian masters, uh, in his text, um, uh, the Compendium of Ascertainments, he does say that you can do this. And so it's, they say that certain schools obviously uh, had that tradition, but they say in our school, we don't accept it. Um, but yeah, I don't know what, uh, what the source is, what they do today. Um, and then just a couple more points about uh, the Apatthika. Uh, so some of you might know, we talk about the 10 non-virtuous actions. This is another way of talking about um, you know, non-virtue that uh, not just the opposite of the five precepts, but we say there's non-virtue, uh, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, uh, lying, and then divisive speech, harsh speech, idle speech. Those are four of speech. And then three of mind, which are covetousness, ill, Ill will, and uh, wrong views. So uh, the last three, the three of, of mind actually Prati moksha vows are not understood to guard against uh, mental states. But there's no way to break your prati moksha vow with a state of mind. You can go against the advice. It's like the Buddha said, better not to think this way. That's related to the vow. But the prati moksha vows can only be broken fully by engaging in actions of body and speech. Um, so there's seven of those. There's the three non-virtues of uh, uh, body and the four of speech and then setting aside those three that are mental. So fully ordained monks and nuns, within their vows, it's included restraint against all seven of those. But for lay people, there's only four of them. So in terms of harsh speech, 
idle speech and divisive speech, there is no vow to uh, abstain from those. It's still encouraged that one should do so because, of course, it's non-virtue. Uh, but one doesn't take the vow. It's only it's understood to be a four part, and then in the first four, and then adding on alcohol because that is so uh, dangerous, as the Buddha said. And again, I'll I'll discuss that when we talk about that. So we have the five uh, five upasthika vows. So I'll go through them one at a time. Some of the details of them. So first of all, we have the vow not to kill. Uh, so, the really the root vow we say is killing a human being. So, killing a human being intentionally breaks the vow from the root. Uh, now, as a monk, it's pretty clear what happens. Uh, when a monk breaks a vow from the root, they can no longer be a monk. Uh, for a lay person, it's actually not entirely clear. If somebody kills somebody, can they still have their lay vows? Uh, or do they have to retake them, or can they even retake them? It's not, there's actually seem to be different points on that. But with everything, it's very important to distinguish between something that's done with or without concealment. Uh, so if, if a layperson unfortunately loses control of themselves and kills somebody, if they then think, I'm go not going to tell anybody, and I'm going to keep this hidden and pretend I'm still a pure layperson, then that's much more damaging than if they immediately think, I made a mistake, I'm going to confess this. Even if they don't do it right away, that's an important distinction. Like if I kill somebody and I say, I want to confess it to my teacher, not just anybody, and I'm not going to see him until next month, I'll confess next month, that's okay. As opposed to, uh, I'm never going to tell anybody, having that thought. Um, but if somebody loses the vow from the root, uh, you know, generally it's understood it's, it's better to take the vow again, that uh, you know, you've really gone so far against it that the vows are damaged. Um, but then we have, say, four kinds of killing. So there's killing a human being is the first one. The second is killing an animal. So killing an animal is not uh, breaking the vow from the root, uh, but it's still a negative action and it's still breaking the vow in the sense that it's not just that you're creating non-virtue by killing an animal, you're creating non-virtue by having taken the vow and then, uh, and then doing it. Uh, so this, of course, includes anything, for mosquitoes as well. Um, so you have to be careful, but um, you know, with anything, um, we also have to recognize, you know, there are circumstances where some where it might be unavoidable. Uh, it's hard to say. Now, it's in the in the Vinaya, which is the the uh, rules that are related to the Pratimoksha vows. There is no permission in any case, in any context for killing. The permission would mean that if you do something, there's no breakage of the vow. Um, so, for example. Uh, you know, for a monk or nun, we have the vow not to eat in the evening, but there's permission to do so uh, if you're sick. So if you eat in the evening when you're sick, there's no negativity whatsoever. You didn't break your vow because you have permission to do so. There's never a, so if you have, you know, for uh, an example that we have in our monastery, we've had the past year, two years, we have dengue fever now. So if you get bitten by a mosquito, you have a good chance of getting dengue fever. So you might want to, you know, Think about if you have no other choice, do you kill the mosquito? But there's no permission to do that in the sense that it's not that if you do it, well, the Buddha said it's okay because you're afraid of dengue. It doesn't, you know, whether you do it or not, it's really kind of at your own discretion. You have to think about what is, what is the right thing? Am I willing to do it in this case? And to be honest, I, I'm not sure I really agreed with this, but the monastery, they were, they were spraying, uh, you know, insecticide around the monastery this year. Uh, part of why I don't agree with it is I just think it was the right approach. <laughs> I think they probably would have been better that more people had screens, which a lot of people don't even have screens in their rooms. And it was also kind of dangerous. They didn't really take care, I think, uh, to avoid you know, spraying it around where people are staying. Um, but they, the, in any case, the people who are senior in the monastery decided that this was what we had to do. It was more beneficial uh, than... Um, allowing many, many monks to get sick, because dengue is a actually a contagious disease. It doesn't spread person to person, but if there's a mosquito bites one person, then another. So I, I think, I would guess that more than half of the monks had dengue fever this year. So, yeah, it's, it's considerable what, what is more important. And when we talk about the bodhisattva vows in the afternoon, I'll talk about that, because my, I, I would expect that they were viewing this 
uh, the bodhisattva, uh, part of the bodhisattva vows, because one of the bodhisattva vows is that if you, uh, if you're in a position where breaking the bodhi, uh, refuge, breaking the party moksha vow, or not breaking the party moksha vow, would obstruct your creating virtue, then you're breaking the bodhisattva vow by not breaking the party moksha vow. So I'll discuss that the ramifications of that a lot more in the afternoon, because that can also be a dangerous way to think sometimes. But my under my expectation is that that was that was what they were thinking when they did this. That you know, whoever was doing it would say, "I'm breaking my party moksha vow now," but in order to save many people from from illness, and it is understood that of, of course killing a mosquito is negative, but killing a human being is a lot worse. It, the mosquito has experienced a lot less suffering and has a lot less potential. Uh, whereas allowing many, many people to get a serious illness uh, is, uh, even His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I know, has, uh, in one context I've heard about uh, directly, where he, he somebody asked him, they had to, um, essentially, in order to um, make a, uh, an, a medicine that would stop an allergy to ants, they had to kill a lot of ants. And His Holiness said, yes, of course, you should do that. Because in order to save this person's life, who would another otherwise get that medicine? So we have to think about that. Um, but in any case, as much as possible, we try to limit. Um, and then the other two types of killing are not directly killing something, so a human or an animal, but that you do something that could put something in danger. So the traditional example is given in splashing water. That if, because in ancient India, there were these ponds or whatever that had, of course, lots of insects in it. Nowadays, you might think of a sink, which probably doesn't have insects. But it, natural water sources have a lot of insects. So if you splash water just for no reason, uh, then that could, could harm something. So if you do that for your own benefit, that's one type of killing. And for somebody else's benefit, that's another type of killing. So that becomes four, uh, human, animal, and then those last two. Um, but of course, there are many more examples of this. So in the Vinaya, even for monks and nuns, we have a lot of other direct uh, advice of the Buddha. For example, a monk should not dig the earth because you might kill animals or build a house. And there are certain times when you have permission to do so. Uh, but generally, uh, these are you know, things that could harm others. And in the modern world, there's a lot more to think about, I think, um, in terms of the destruction of the environment, all of the different ways that our actions could impact the environment. And it's impossible that we can avoid this all entirely, but we have to think about everything we do is going to have some uh, consequences that could be harmful. Now we have uh, generally two different kinds of negative actions. We have actions that are naturally negative, like killing, and then ones that are negative by prescription, meaning that it's not actually a negative action, but because the Buddha said not to do it, and if you don't think, I don't care what the Buddha said, I'm going to do it anyway, then it becomes negative. So these latter two types of killing fall into that. It's not considered naturally negative. Otherwise, we just would be you know, creating negative karma constantly without really any, um, any way to stop it. Now, personally, I sometimes wonder, you know, it's, it's not that there's like a fine line. Uh, I, I would think that there is going to be some negativity. But generally speaking, it's said that these, you know, to not dig in the earth, not splash the water. And it, it, it's just, it, 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 it indirectly could kill something, but you're not having that intention. So it's not directly negative, but it's advised not to do it. And when you take the vow not to kill, you're taking the vow not to do these things unnecessarily. You have to always think about your actions. Now, because it's a prescribed action, then there is permission. Killing, there's no permission to do so in any circumstance. But for the prescribed actions, there can be permission. So for example, I said, digging the earth, a monk shouldn't dig in the earth, but, and a monk shouldn't build a house. But if there's a good reason, if you want to build a place to meditate, and the Sangha discusses it, and they decide this is unacceptable in this, in this context, then the person can do so. Uh, so they're not breaking the vow because there's permission to do so. Uh, so lay people don't have all of the same you know, very specific vows that monks and nuns have, but generally speaking, it's encouraged to be aware of all of our actions and how it could be harmful to other species around us. Um, and on that note, I thought actually just to talk briefly about uh, vegetarianism. Is it something that 
also I, I consider quite important. Um, so I'll just say briefly, personally, uh, I became vegetarian when I was 17. This is actually before I was a Buddhist. Um, the reason originally was uh, I took, I was in a philosophy class in high school and our teacher had us read uh, the books of Peter Singer. Some of you might know Animal Liberation. It's one of the early uh, books of the animal rights movement. Uh, and when I read that book, being very interested in philosophy at the time, it just seemed to me, you know, it's airtight. What he's, His argument is correct. I didn't want it to be correct <laughs> because I, I enjoyed eating meat, but uh, I, it seemed to me this is right. Now, for some time, I just kind of ignored that. But after about six months, I, I realized I couldn't live that way, feeling that I, what I was doing was not what, you know, what I felt was ethically right. Uh, so I stopped eating meat. Uh, however, I still had the very strong idea that this was unhealthy, that I was de therefore depriving myself, having grown up in American culture where we're encouraged to be big and strong. Um, and so for a few years, occasionally I would eat meat still because I just felt, oh, I'm feeling really weak today and I have to do it even though I don't want to. Now, when I became a monk, when I was 23, I decided I'm never going to eat meat again. And I haven't, except in one circumstances, accidentally. <laughs> I gave him some food that I didn't know what it was. But other than that, uh, I've been very strict. But even the, so, for some, quite some years, I had the idea that what I'm doing is is unhealthy and I, I would be healthier if I occasionally ate meat. And um, similarly to that, not long after I became vegetarian, um, I actually started thinking it would be better to be vegan, not to take um, milk, you know, dairy, or eggs. Some of my friends in college encouraged me in that. But then I thought, no, this is just too unhealthy. I'll be too, uh, I'll be too weak if I don't eat these things. Um, so again, when I became a monk, I pretty much gave up eggs. Occasionally, I would eat eggs, but it was impossible to give up milk, especially living in a Tibetan monastery where that's one of their main staple foods. Um, but when I was in my mid thirties, I started reading a lot more about this. So this is just something I, I thought to share because it might be helpful for people who are thinking about this. And as I come to understand more about this, the science of nutrition, I think I had a wrong view. I think that actually not eating meat or any animal product is a lot healthier. Um, and if somebody is interested in that, um, I think the best book I read on this, some of you might know, is called The China Study, uh, which is uh, about, there was originally a study done in China, which is why it's called The China Study, uh, which was in the 1970s. But based on that, which was a very thorough study, it's said to be the, the, um, the, the mo demographically the most diverse and largest uh, nutrition study ever done. Um, but on the basis of that, then a lot of people have done further research into the findings of that. And it seems that there really is a lot of very strong evidence uh, that uh, avoiding animal products is healthier in a lot of ways. And that it, the main reason most people don't know that is because it goes against what most of us believe. And so the culture doesn't support it. Um, there's all kinds of, of course, you can find a study, one, one study that's going to find that people who drink milk are healthier than people who drink soy milk or one other, whatever other thing. Um, but there's a question of, first of all, what studies are being published and emphasized and which ones are being done based on who's funding it. Um, so again, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but if people are interested in that, uh, I think it's, it's very helpful because as I said, for me, um, I wanted to be, I wanted to avoid these foods for a long time for the ethical reasons. It was a lot easier to do so once I discovered, uh, what I felt were the, uh, the health reasons for doing so as well. Um, so in Buddhism, uh, as many of you might know, there is no rule about being vegetarian. Um, but the Buddha encourages it. He said, if it, you can be, it's better to be. And he said, especially because you have the vow not to kill an animal. Of course, you can't kill your own meat, but also you can't, you know, at least for a monk, but, uh, you know, it's a, the same logic would apply to lay people if they want to follow it strictly is don't eat something that you know somebody killed for you or that uh, you suspect that they killed for you because you're, you're direct, you know, contributing it to more directly. Um, so obviously the emphasis is on avoiding 
uh, meat if possible. But really, it seems like the main reason that the Buddha didn't advocate for strict vegetarianism was because he and his monks were beggars. And so they, they, it would actually have been detrimental to their survival, as, not in terms of what they eat, but just in terms of their reputation. If they had gone around saying, give me this, don't give me that, I, don't, I won't eat that, I don't, I'm not going to take what you give me. Uh, so that was um, you know, the reason that was explicitly given. That is clearly a good reason. And that's still the reason in, in countries where the, that tradition of begging is still um, strong, which is mainly in Southeast Asia and Theravada and Buddhist countries. Um, but sometimes I wonder if the Buddha had been in a situation where the monks are not begging, and whether he will, really would have encouraged them uh, to, you know, when they have a choice, uh, to, to choose to eat, uh, you know, to not to eat meat. But that's, again, it's, there's no particular rule, so somebody shouldn't feel, I have to, and if I'm a Buddhist, I'm a bad Buddhist if I'm eating meat. I mean, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, we know, uh, eats meat. Um, his Holiness' the story is that he, um, he was vegetarian for some time, but then uh, after he had hepatitis, his doctors insisted that he ate meat, so he agreed that he would eat it every second day. So I think he's vegetarian every second day. Um, and I know, living in the monastery, most Tibetans eat meat. I think it's a very strong cultural thing. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not that you should feel, I can't be a Buddhist if I want to eat meat, but it's just something to, to consider and, and to think about. Uh, and as I said before, with everything, uh, to examine, to really examine clearly uh, the different assumptions that go behind our, our understanding of nutrition and so forth. And of course, you know, to read about some of the suffering of animals. You know, this is what, when I read Peter Singer's book, that was one of the strongest things that he fo focuses on in animal liberation is just uh, describing in great detail uh, some of the suffering that goes on uh, for animals who are slaughtered. Uh, so next we have uh, the vow against stealing. This is the second. Uh, so when we study Vinaya, this year we studied, it was the first of a three-year study of Vinaya. And we did actually study the vow on not stealing this year. That was the most complicated thing we studied this year. It has a lot of difficulties in defining it. When we think about it, it might seem very straightforward, but the hardest ones are, if, if for, especially for a monk, as I said, if a monk steals, then that is also a defeat for a monk. A monk can no longer be a monk. Well, how much do you have to steal? <laughs> That's the very big question. You know, so if, if there's some water here, somebody left, and I drink their water, am I no longer a monk? That's pretty un well understood. No, um, unless the water is very expensive, maybe. <laughs> um, but there, there has to be some limit. And so there's a lot of disagreement on that. And then secondly, what, what constitutes having stolen something? So if I grab something you know, from you and I take your scarf, but then you grab it back, did I steal it? Well, I had it for two seconds. <laughs> um, or if I ask someone else to steal it. So if I ask him to steal your scarf and he steals it and I don't know that he stole it, did I create the karma of stealing then or only when I find out that he stole it? These are some of the big questions, and we, you know, we have a good time debating these. This is what we like to do. It's, all kind of, it's nice to have things that aren't clear, because then we can enjoy it, enjoy our discussions. Um, but you know, the simple thing is pretty clear, that we don't take things that are not given. Um, so uh, that includes physical objects, and also even in the, in the ancient texts, it talks about taxes and things like that. That if somebody, you know, if you know that you are like a customs fee, this is what is explicit in the text. If you know that you have to pay a customs fee and you intentionally avoid it, then you've created, the, you know, the directly, con you know, it's the, you said the um, break, broken the vow from the root, because that's the same as having stolen that amount of money. Now, if you don't know that you have to do it, that's very different. Um, it's good to be aware of these things as much as possible, but, you know, it's, is a big difference between being doing something unintentionally and fully knowing what you're doing. Um, so, like I said, with the killing vow uh, about being careful about everything, there's also in terms of stealing. In the modern world, there's a lot of things we have to be aware of. We can't just avoid things entirely, but 
we have to know when we buy things, what was what went into making this, who was exploited uh, to make this or this product to, to to get get it. And sometimes it's just impossible to avoid these entirely. And it's like I said before, with the with the different types of killing that it's very different. It's not like it's the same to kill somebody and to do something that could lead to somebody else dying, although we don't know. Now, actually, I mentioned before, Peter Singer, that was one of his arguments that he made that nowadays I disagree with, which he said that if, uh, if, I, if I live in a first world country and I have a lot of money and there's people starving in the third world country and I don't use my money to save them from starving, it's the same as killing somebody. Now, in Buddhist philosophy, that's not true. Oh, it yes, it it is still in in the, some functionally it has the same uh, can have the same effect, but it's you're much more removed from it. Your motivation is much different. Otherwise, we could just blame everybody and everybody's guilty, and because nobody can can always do everything right for everybody. So we have to be able to make some delineation. This is more negative than that, you know. Otherwise, um, another question is: is it even the best course of action if I'm very wealthy to just give all of my money away to poor people. A lot of people would argue that's not actually the best way to help everybody. Uh, there might be better ways to invest it in you know, socially responsible programs rather than just giving it away. Like in India, we have this problem a lot. We have a lot of beggars, but we know that a lot of them, unfortunately, are, are not honest. That They might belong to some syndicate that puts them out there and they take the money and they give it back to their boss and he puts them out there again and they get more money. So is it really the best thing to just go around giving away all my money? In some cases, certainly, but it's not quite the same to not give it to a beggar as to actively harm somebody. And likewise with stealing, um, you know, we want to, as best as we can, to uh, be socially responsible uh, and, um, and, and, and research things and know what where are things are coming from, where our money is going. But we don't have to have this sense of burden of I'm doing so bad and everything I do is bad every day. And that's not really helpful. Uh, it's good to also focus on the positive that we are doing with what we have and um, what we can do in our situation. Uh, and then a third question that's specific to the modern world that's very hard is piracy. And this has been quite an issue in the monastery a few times. Uh, because, yeah, again, for a monk or nun, as I said, if I was to not pay a customs fee, that would be a defeat. I'm no longer a monk. So if I download software that I wasn't supposed to download, what, you know, what happens? Um, and so we've had some pretty heated discussions about this because you can imagine some people think it's perfectly fine to do it. So somebody else might think, well, then he's just broken his vow. That's quite a, a difference of opinion. Um, over the years, and also from some sort of bad experiences from confronting people when I realized it really wasn't the right thing to do, I've come to see that you know, I think it's the kind of thing where in the, in the Vinaya, nothing is negative until the Buddha stipulates that it is. There is no breaking of the vow until the Buddha makes the vow. So until the Sangha agrees, comes together and has a consensus, this is what we agree upon as the rules. I don't think we can arbitrarily say this is wrong and I, I therefore think this is breaking the vow because it's uh, there's enough lack of clarity that it's it's not just entirely clear. The Buddha said if something is very clear that you can uh, apply the same logic. So for example, don't dig in the earth, also don't dig in sand. This is the, uh, an example that's often given. Um, it's the same logic. It's not soil, but it's the same issue of that it might harm animals. But software piracy is not quite the same as, as stealing something. Um, but at the same time, personally, I always do my best to avoid it because I think it, it clearly, even though it's not fully breaking the vow, it's certainly it's to a certain level. Like in the Vinaya, we have different levels of breaking the vow. So um, you, can, you can come very close to breaking the vow, whereas one factor is not complete. So like I stab somebody, but they don't die. Then it's what's called a... Bompo in Tibetan. I forget the Sanskrit, the, the, the Pali I know is Tula Makaya. It means like a heavy action, which just means that um, yeah, you, you come very close to breaking the vow, and there's very serious 
consequences, but it's not fully breaking the vow. So I think also with you know with software piracy and things like that, you know if I know that if I download this movie from this website, it, it's illegal, and I'm taking what I would otherwise have to pay somewhere else, and that's very close to fully stealing. But I, I think one argument that could be made is that you're not actually taking something away from the other person. The the person who who made the movie doesn't lose anything except that you didn't give them something. So in that sense, it might be the good argument could be made that it's not fully breaking the vow, but still, it's certainly not encouraged. It's certainly, as a monk, uh, I think you know it would have serious consequences. But it's something that really needs to be, you know, more, um, as I said before, more. There has to be some kind of consensus before we can go around saying this this person. Uh, broke their vow, but personally, we have to think about what we feel uh, is ethical and the right way to behave and with that. So then we have uh, the third vow, the restraint against sexual misconduct, which is also quite complicated. And for us as monks and nuns, a lot easier, actually, just no sexual behavior whatsoever. So when we just studied Vinaya, that's mainly what we studied is in terms of from monastics, what that means. Um, but in terms of what it means for lay people, you know, it's where do you draw the line in terms of what is proper conduct, what is misconduct? So the first thing I, I want to say, uh, which might come as a surprise to some people, but it's important to be aware of this. In, in Buddhist philosophy, any sexual action whatsoever is negative. There is no positive karma that comes uh, from sexuality. Now, some people might react strongly to that, especially because we might be conditioned from certain religions where there's a sense of guilt that if you do this, it's dirty and you're therefore a bad person. But it's not really the point here. And Buddhism in, in general just doesn't have this sense of, of guilt and this person is, is bad and stained. It's simply that what makes something a negative action is that it leads to a suffering result. And the main result of suffering is to be reborn in cyclic existence again. And sexual attachment is understood to be the strongest driving force that causes rebirth in cyclic existence. And the more we engage in sexual activity, it will only increase sexual attachment. So again, some people might argue against that. Oh, if, oh, if I do this, you know, I do it once and I feel better and I don't need to do it again. But Buddhist philosophy is with any desire, if we, if we fulfill it, it will just call, create the imprint to want to fulfill it again. So in a general sense, uh, any sexual action is negative. Now, of course, some are a lot more negative than others, and some can be, you know, it, there can be some positive aspect of it. You know, for example, we really care about somebody you know, for their benefit. We want to make them feel better, or we want to you know, have a child. And that's our main motivation. So it's understood that any action can have different levels of motivation. There's the causal motivation, and there's the motivation of the time of the action. So the causal motivation could actually be virtuous. You know, I want to have a child for this reason, and I want to care for the child. That is the causal motivation. But the time of the action, which is actually engaging in sexual activity, there has to be attachment. You know, for an ordinary being, it's just impossible to engage in sexual activity without having sexual desire. And so that in itself has some kind of negativity that then brings more dissatisfaction in the future. So then the question is, well, for lay people, the vow is not to avoid sexual activity entirely. So where do we say this is misconduct and this is okay? So I thought about that you know, some in the past years because I know people like right now are going to be wondering, what do I say as a monk? One thing I think is that it's not quite the domain of the, of the monastics to make that distinction because we know less about it than the lay people probably do. And it's a bit heavy handed for monastics to go around saying, you should do this and you can't do that. Um, but I will try to explain to some of the perimeters that are understood in the traditional texts. Um, so, well, the obvious one is not to harm. I think that's the most obvious. So, of course, rape or adultery, you know, where there's an obvious case where if I um, have engaged in sexual relations with this person, then it will hurt somebody else who will feel betrayed. And that's obviously uh, going to be harmful to someone else. And those are the main 
uh, ones that are usually mentioned. Um, but then there's a question, does it go further than that? So uh, one of my favorite teachers, Thich Nhat Hanh, so a lot of you might know, in his interpretation of this, he talks about it as only having sexual conduct within a committed relationship. Now, I haven't seen that in any traditional Buddhist text. I don't think it is in the text, um, but I don't think they had that quite the same concept as we have today of we distinguish committed relationship or this or that. Um, but I think that is one thing to think about. And again, as I say, as a monastic, I'm not going to go around saying you have to do this or that, or you have to have this particular interpretation of it, but that's one way to think about it. Because really what it's understood with sexual misconduct, the vow, is to try to limit our sexual, uh, you know, our sexual behavior, because we understand that just engaging it in it uh, you know, without any restraint is not going to bring happiness. So we want to say, well, I'm going to limit it to this amount. So if we say I'm going to limit it only to a, one particular partner, that immediately puts some kind of limit on it. Um, but as I say, I, I certainly don't think someone should feel they're breaking the vow from the root from not doing that, because I don't see anything about that in the traditional text. But one thing we do see in the text, which is a lot more difficult perhaps, is saying certain kinds of sexual behavior. Um, so this, this is, can be very controversial. I don't think they meant it that way, but nowadays it will be, uh, which is they talk about you know, oral and anal sex which is said in the, in the, for example, the Lamarum by Sankatva, it talks about these as sexual misconduct. So if somebody, of course, the best example is a homosexual man, then it doesn't really leave them much option. It's basically saying don't engage in any sexual activity. Uh, so I think this is something important as again, with everything to really examine closely why somebody said this, where it came from and what, and what was the reasoning behind it. So for one thing, I don't think, as far as I can tell, I have not seen any source for that uh, in, the teach, in the original teachings in the Vinaya. So of course, for a monk or nun, there's that, but any kind of sexual activity is going to be breaking their vows. Um, you know, I, I know, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, Alex Burson, the, the Western scholar, he, his, and his website, when he talks about this, his research seems to be that he feels this entered Buddhism in the second and third centuries with uh, like Vasubandhu's text, when there was certain social mores in India that were then being just adopted. That it's just well, we don't do this because this is what's considered uh, inappropriate. And actually, in even today in India, um, that's illegal. These things. Uh, I don't know how much they uh, they enforce that law, uh, but technically, it's a very long prison sentence for, for engaging that kind of activity. Um, so obviously in India, that was considered something that was negative, and therefore it's just adopted. We want, we follow a lot of, in Buddhism, a lot of times it's, it, it adopts what, it, what the culture considers negative, because we want to be accepted as a, as a group within the culture. Um, and then of course, if we read, if some of you might have read some Kapoor's presentation in the Lamrim of sexual misconduct, Again, this is what I said before, that it's clear he doesn't really have any experience with this. It just seems like he's saying a bunch of things based on you know, what he's read. For, you know, for example, he says you know, not having sex too frequently. And he says too frequently would mean five times in one night. So you know, I think most people are going to stay with that. But the point is that it's clear he's just kind of, he doesn't really know what people do. So he's just saying, well, let's just make a bunch of parameters. Um, you know, so I'm not obviously in a position of authority to, to say uh, what, you know, what we can and can't follow. But I think if somebody feels that this is uh, not something that they, you know, that particular emphasis is not something that applies to them, it's really important to look closely at it and talk with their personal teacher and see that you know, it's, it's certainly not meant to be discriminatory or to um, you know, make people feel bad that, oh, this is bad, this is bad, because ultimately, as I said, any sexual activity is going to have, create more desire and therefore create more suffering. It's not like one is good and one is bad. They're really the idea that they're, what, as I mentioned, look at why they were saying this, it's because they were just trying to make, say, well, we're going to have it only within a certain boundary. So you don't just do anything you feel like. And so we'll say, I'm going to just limit myself to this and this. 
Um, but I think, you know, personally, as a practitioner, there should be some degree of, especially when you take a vow, of deciding what you're going to be vowing to do. Um, you know, this comes back to the original point of can you take some of the vows and not others? Um, and yeah, I think it, it's hard because, as I said, there's what was written in the text, but other traditions might interpret it differently. And so we can see that what's written in the text isn't necessarily what traces back directly to how it was always taught. And, uh, and again, this is something in the future when I'm in a position where I'm more senior, it's something I would certainly want to discuss with other, um, you know, other good, considered holders of the Vinaya about where do we set the parameters? Because it's obviously very important for lay people. It's not to just say that you can, you have to be celibate like monks and nuns. And the other thing that sometimes can become confusing for people, I think, in the Tibetan Buddhist uh, presentation is Tantra. And because here it seems to be saying, well, actually, you know, sex can be good. It can be part of your spiritual path, uh, which I, can lead to a lot of misunderstanding. Um, so again, that's not something I'll go into too deeply here. Uh, but the main point would be that it still doesn't say ever in Tantra that ordinary sexual uh, conduct is virtuous. Um, and it, it's not just encouraging people to be to just act on their desires. It's talking about when people have very advanced levels of meditative uh, concentration. And what it really means very advanced, like that somebody can uh, talk about the subtle generation stage, somebody can visualize many deities in the size of mustard seed and hold concentration on that for six hours without being distracted. And they mean that quite literally, I think. It's not just a figurative idea. Then it's possible to use their sexual desire as a way of increasing their concentration. Um, but it's done in a very specific way. It's not just done that they just, therefore they just follow desi their desires whenever they want to. Uh, and it's also, at least in our school, the Gaelic school, it's very strictly not done by monks and nuns. It's not that when a monk reaches the stage, then he cannot be celibate anymore. It's not at all like that. Um, but it is understood that there can be some use of sexual desire as a way of enhancing meditation. Um, but that shouldn't be confused with therefore, therefore saying that ordinary sexual uh, behavior is therefore good now and that, it, that people are encouraged to do that. So they, you know, as I say, there can be a lot of people can get that impression because, of course, it's not made clear what's being talked about. Um, so I won't get into that too much now. But again, that's something people have further questions. You let me know at the end. So we have two more vows. I don't have a lot of time, but I'll go through them much as quick as I can. So we have lying. Um, so again, to break the vow of vowing, uh, vow of lying from the root would be to lie about a spiritual attainment. And so to knowingly state, when you know you haven't attained it, to say, I've attained calm abiding. I've realized bodhicitta, I've realized emptiness. I've achieved, I have a direct perception of emptiness. I'm an Arya being, I'm an Arhat, I'm a Buddha, something like that, any of those. Um, or also to say that uh, I can, I have clairvoyance and I can be ghosts uh, and I can see gods. Um, so, of course, if you can, that's very different. Or if you think you can and you're mistaken, uh, then it's, it's quite different than intentionally lying about it. But intentionally trying to deceive someone, that is breaking the vow from the root. And then just ordinary lies. Uh, um, you know, again, we have to look at, there's a scale. There's some, some lies are very negative and some lies in some context, it really might seem like the best thing to do. We have to think about what is the best way to behave here. Um, and so we're not going to be able to av always avoid you know, slight falsehoods, but as much as possible to represent things truthfully. Uh, again, I mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh before. He talks about, because I notice this a lot with myself, exaggerating the truth, that you want to ex explain to somebody how great it is to be a monk. So I talk about all the wonderful things, and really, it's not that good, right? So we have to be very careful in our speech. Are we, uh, are we just making it more so than it is? Or, you know, if I say, um, 
Yeah, I've noticed this also. I could say, um, you know, if I'm I'm really tired tonight, and this is just a simple thing, but I only got two hours of sleep last night. I know I got three, but I just must say two because it sounds it sounds more you know that I really didn't get any sleep. So you just notice that come out of your mouth, and you think you know some part of me is still has this tendency. So it's okay if that happens, but just be aware of that and try as much as possible uh, to to be truthful about things. And then finally, we have the vow against intoxicants. Um, so as I said before, there's there's some sometimes it's interpreted, uh, you know, as not to not to become drunk. But in in the vow in the in the vinaya, it's very clear. It's not about taking alcohol at all or other intoxicants. And the Buddha was quite forceful about this. Um, you know, he said that it, that alcohol is basically the worst thing of any of these. It's not a naturally non-virtuous action. That's an important point. The first four are. Drinking alcohol is not naturally non-virtuous, uh, but it causes you to lose your mind, to lose control of your mind. And therefore, you can engage in anything else. And in Buddhism, our main goal is to gain more control of our mind, and more concentration, more mental clarity. And this is doing the exact opposite. Uh, any kind of uh, drug or intoxicant. Um, now, it's important, again, the main vow is against alcohol. So are there other things? Well, should, therefore, should I not take med medicine? That is, you know, like morphine or something like that. I don't know of many people who interpret it that way. And I would, interpret, I would not interpret it that way if I was in a situation where the only option is you take a painkiller or you're in intolerable pain, then probably I'd, I'd go for that. Um, but as much as possible to be aware of different things we consume and the effect they're having on our mind um, because we're trying to gain more and more clarity. And so if it has the opposite effect, it will just lead to you know, more non-virtue. Um, and of course, health problems that we can get from that. Um, you know, just to give one example, though, I think it's a nice story. <laughs> it, not totally related to this, but um, you know that even with painkillers, if somebody's maybe very advanced, maybe they don't, they have less need for them. So I heard a story about uh, Geshe Rapton, some of you might know, who was one of the teachers of Lama Yeshe, Lama Zopar and Bishay. I don't think his picture is here. Um, he passed away in 1982, I think. Uh, but this was a story that was told to me by somebody else that had talked to his student, who was a, a Swiss person. Uh, so he had, he had directly uh, witnessed this and then told the story to uh, one of my teachers, one of my Western teachers at the monastery who told me about it. Um, so Geshe Rabdin, he lived for a long time in Switzerland and in Italy. And at one point, he ha had to have a spinal tap, I guess, to, to test for something, which is, I, I don't know a lot about it, but apparently it's, you know, something that you have to put somebody under uh, anesthesia because it would be intolerably painful. So the doctor said, now we're going to give you the anesthetic. And he said, no, no, no need. And the doctor said, no, basically insisted, said, I, I cannot legally allow you to do this because if, if you, something happens in the operation, you, you, know, you jump because you're in pain, it, you know, the, the cord or something could snap and it could actually cause your death and I'll be legally responsible. But he insisted, so the doctor eventually made him sign a waiver that he would not sue the doctor if anything happened. And he, and he just, I guess, said something like to the doctor, well, you do what you, need, what you need to do and I'll do what I need to do. And so he just went into meditation and they did the spinal tap and nothing. He didn't have any movement all the time. Uh, so, you know, there could be cases where somebody's at that level, but in Buddhism, we're always very practical. So you have to recognize if I'm not at that level, I don't want to pretend that I am. And so in that case, it's, it's, you know, it's okay. The, the intention of taking the morphine is not to become intoxicated. The intention is to, you know, as a medicine. Although, in terms of alcohol, the Buddha said, as a medicine, don't even take it, uh, for a monk or nun, especially. Um, even, if, even if your choice is you drink alcohol, you die, and the Buddha said, better you die. Uh, because for a monk or nun, it's so detrimental, what we're trying to cultivate. It would be so detrimental to the Sangha if a monastic was seen being drunk, um, and then the things that they could do, and they could say. And then the Buddha said, it's, you know, it's that important not to do so. Um, but again, as I said, uh, for lay people, 
you know, ideally it's best not to not to take any alcohol, but um, His Holiness has, in certain circumstances, it seems that he does say to people, you, um, it's important when you take the vow that you have a particular um, uh, commit, you know, what you're committing to. If you've committed when you take the vow, I'm never going to drink alcohol, then really you should keep that. But His Holiness has said, when if you want to commit to, I'm not going to drink more than one or two a day, then a cups a day, then that's, you know, he obviously is giving permission for that. Uh, and then finally, uh, in terms of the Parti Moksha vow, is what to do if you break them, how to repair them. Uh, so the most basic thing that the Buddha encouraged was I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the one day vows. So this is to take a set of vows for 24 hours that are more strict. And the Buddha encouraged the lay followers to do this, especially on the 8th, 15th, and 30th of the lunar month, uh, just because those were considered auspicious days in the Indian calendar, um, as a way of restoring and purifying your vows. Because as monastics, uh, we meet twice a month on full and new moon to confess our vows and to purify them. So it said for lay people, this is the, the ritual that is encouraged to do, is to take this one, these one-day vows. Um, which in addition to the five vows, then you have celibacy instead of sexual misconduct. And then you have not to, as I think I mentioned before, not to take orna have ornaments, not to play music, not to sit on a high seat, not to eat in the evening. Um, now, some of you might be familiar, we call the eight Mahayana precepts. I think a lot of you might have taken those. So in the Tibetan tradition, this tradition of the one day Prati Moksha vows, it doesn't seem to be existent as far as I can tell. So people usually take the eight Mahayana precepts, which is functionally the same thing, uh, but they're not included in Parti Moksha vows. They're part of the Bodhisattva vows. Um, so you take them with the Bodhicitta motivation, but the the vows, the restraints are exactly the same. You don't do these certain things. The only difference is that when you take Mahayana precepts, you're not allowed to eat any meat or onion or garlic. It's a black foods. Uh, whereas with the one day vows for lay people, there's no there's nothing like that. But generally speaking, it's it's the same uh, same vows. Uh, so it's good to try to take those just in general when you can, but also as a way if you feel you've broken a vow in a difficult, you know, in an important way that you want to uh, purify it. And then, of course, as I said at the beginning, if you if you break it from the root, like if you kill somebody, then it's really important to confess that to a teacher and and probably take the vows again. Um, and then, of course, there's daily practices. So one of the most common is to recite. We call the the Sutra of the Three Heaps, which you probably know as the 35 Confession Buddhas. You do prostrations and recite this. So it's good as much as possible to recite that as a way of purifying one's vows and lots of many other purification practices you can find out about. But those are the ones that are especially recommended for the Prati Moksha vows. So I think yeah, we've already reached noon. I was hoping to have time for question and answer. So I don't want to keep people from lunch, but if there are any any questions, we can at least take a couple now, and we'll have maybe more time in the afternoon, because we have a lot more time to do sessions for the Bodhisattva vows. So if you have questions about Prati Moksha vows, then you could also ask them then. But uh, for now, does anyone have any questions? So my question is, um, well, I Clarification. This is something I've been thinking about, especially because I've yeah. uh, been tearing up vows. I've been thinking about that for a while. And um, something that comes to mind for me is that plants are also alive. Mm -hmm. Yes. The wood that we cut down trees to yes. houses are also yes. alive. Yes, yes, that's true. So how is that? It's a very good question. And actually, I meant to mention something about that. So the question for you, in case on Zoom you didn't hear, was about, you know, plants are also alive and wood is also alive. So if we're eating plants, you know, is it also an act of killing? So there's a few things on that. Um, first of all, setting aside plants for a second, because the point, one point I did, did want to make is that one argument some people make uh, is that if I eat vegetables, well, what's the difference? Because so many bugs get killed in the farming, which is true. Uh, but there's, I think there's two differences. One is that um, it's again about more direct, that you're directly killing something intentionally to eat it, as opposed to it just happens because you can't avoid it. The second thing, uh, you know, as we might 
understand from modern research is that to eat meat requires a lot more cultivation of land than to eat vegetables. So actually, even though you're not eating vegetables and not cultivating land directly, you're contributing a lot more to the destruction of land that animals live on. So in that regard, uh, I, you know, I think that can be a very strong counter argument that really it's clearly more harmful to, to eat meat, not just for the animal that you're eating, but for many other animals. But then in terms of the plants themselves, traditionally in Buddhism, it's understood that plants are not sentient. This is something that distinguished Buddhism from Jainism. Jainism is another Indian religion, and for them, plants have just as, I don't know if they even, they, they do say sentient, actually. They, one of the examples they give is that trees have, they say some kind of tree, they close their leaves at night, and it shows that they have an, they're sentient. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. Personally, as I said, with everything, we have to examine it. And I, I'm not entirely convinced by the Buddhist, traditional Buddhist argument. I think there's definitely a big degree of difference. Um, and so in the same way that it's much more negative to kill a human than to kill a mosquito, it's probably a lot more negative to kill a mosquito than to, to kill a flower. Um, but whether consciousness is exactly the way it's presented as a as a yes or no question in Buddhist tradition, I'm not sure. I'm open to other possibilities of the consciousness developing, you know, grad, gradual kinds of consciousness. Um, but again, the point is, and the Buddha was actually said, you should not just cut plants. If for monk or non, you, you have a vow not to do so. The reason mainly being that it's, it's harmful to the beings that, the other beings that live in the plant, like in a tree, many beings populate that. And also the Buddha said that there are spirits that live in trees. And if you cut the tree, the spirit will get angry. Um, and also because it just is harmful to the overall, uh, you know, the area that we're living in. People, if I cut my neighbor's tree down, he's not going to be very happy. Um, and also it's just a waste of time. This is one of the main things for monks and nuns is that your main focus should be meditation and study and not cultivating the land. Um, but also, um, so like in, in Jainism, you know, they have to eat, of course, if they want to survive. So it, very strict Jains will not eat anything where you have to kill the plant. They'll eat something where you, have to, you can pick the leaves without killing the plant. And the most strict Jains will, will starve themselves to death. This is actually a practice that some Jains undertake. Um, so the Buddha argued against that. He said that's, a, that's, that's really just wasting your human life. Um, so it, it, as like His Holiness said earlier, about, I mentioned that about killing the ants to obtain the medicine, that you can't just completely avoid anything, any violence towards anything when you're living in a physical body. But you want to do it as best you can. And it's very good to be aware of plants, not just to dismiss them, oh, whatever, I'll just eat whatever I like. And I can be a vegetarian, but I'll eat as much food as I want, all the finest food, wherever it comes from, I don't care. You still want to be very conscious of how this food got to you and as much as possible. Um, you know, try to eat things that are, are not violent, not just to animals, but to, uh, you know, the plant world. Um, and then also be aware that I'm, in some sense, I owe something back, that I've been supported by so many different uh, sentient or non-sentient beings, whatever they might be, that I have a responsibility to use my life in a way that will protect them, not just to enjoy myself here. Uh, so it can be a you know, strong motivating factor. This is what we say in samsara. As long as you're in samsara, you're going to be both experiencing suffering and creating suffering. So you want to have the motivation to be free of that, to be in a form where you're no longer causing that. As I said earlier about the Buddha's body, understood in some way that the Buddha's body is no longer the truth of suffering. Uh, somehow it, everything that the Buddha does only creates happiness. It does not create suffering for other beings even though it might appear to do so in, in the short term, it's leading them to, to greater realization. So we want to be able to achieve that state eventually. Yeah. Yes. Earlier, earlier, you mentioned that you become a value. 
Mm-hmm. Have a valid cognition of the three jewels? Yes, yes, it's understood. I mentioned before that the Four Noble Truths are not considered to be a very hidden phenomenon, meaning that there's something that can be understood through reasoning. And the same goes for the three jewels. The three jewels are understood to be something that we can understand through, through reasoning. Now, it's not just reasoning in a vacuum. It requires a lot of help from teachers and from texts and from, you know, personally, I find it very helpful not just to read Buddhist things. To, as I said before, if we have, you say that there's karma, well, rather than just ignoring the theory of atoms and molecules, which is very hard to dis- dismiss comp- entirely, you have to see, is that compatible? It, you know, if, if there's such a thing as a Buddha, then it pretty much guarantees there's such a thing as reincarnation. It doesn't really work to talk about a Buddha in a one light system. So we have to really take, it's not just something we can figure out over the weekend. We have to take a long time to think, well, is there reincarnation? What would that imply? And what would the, what would be the, the consequences of that? But it is understood to be something that we can access. It's not something that only you can know if you have clairvoyance, which is something, a very hidden phenomena. For example, I could know that there is such a thing as a Buddha. Whether you are a Buddha is a different question. That is something that is very hidden. Um, it's not necessary in the case of somebody like Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, it's not very hidden because he showed the aspect very strongly. And I can use a lot of reasoning to determine that this person really probably was enlightened. But for somebody who is, appears to be ordinary, and I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean to say you do, but somebody who might appear to be ordinary and just have ordinary experience, it's, it's actually impossible for me, for me to know for sure. Uh, but I can determine whether that state is possible in general uh, using reasoning. Yeah, okay. Yeah. In Western philosophy, and especially contemporary, there's a lot of morality, morality of action, mm-hmm. which we don't necessarily focus on. So that's synonymous having wisdom. Mm-hmm. I think it's just mm-hmm. focus. That way, I. Of course, we always come back to um, attention, mm-hmm. the root of attention, and why we do certain things, bodies and minds. And so, um, so, I guess um, this thought isn't complete yet. How do we switch between this formal categorization of this action is very negative mm-hmm. when we don't consider the intention and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I know you're saying in the um, second and third century, mm-hmm. some covers adding mm-hmm. um, certain things to text. Mm-hmm. And this isn't um, specific to present Buddhism, mm-hmm. uh, Chinese Mahayana, yeah, of course. a lot of mystic overtones in scripture. Mm-hmm. When we go back to sense, It still does exist that cultural um, push to where we don't necessarily focus on the attention mm-hmm. and we just push out this action. Mm-hmm. Thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I from just using this humor for oneself, um, how do you deal with that, um, the, the, the weight of mm-hmm. citing that? Yeah, okay. So it's hard for me to repeat that entire question on the Zoom, but I th- hopefully people will understand from my answer what the question was about. So I think a lot of w- when you're asking that question, it gives the um, it seems to be coming more from the Bodhisattva from her thinking about things, which we'll talk about in the afternoon, because in the Vinaya, in the Party Moksha, the individual liberation, things are much more cut and dry. This is right. This is wrong. And this is because the motivation is you want to achieve liberation. So if you want to not be born in samsara, you stop creating actions that are cause, will cause you to be born in there. It's pretty simple. When you start, start to think about being a bodhisattva, it's a very different world because you're not just thinking about what I need in order to achieve my liberation. Things are a lot more complicated. And there's not a lot, it's a lot less black and white. What is the right action? So like I said, um, you know, there's never a time in the Vinaya where you're allowed to kill. It's pretty straightforward. 
but as a bodhisattva, it might be the right thing to do. Even though you know that it might make it take longer for you to achieve liberation because you killed somebody. But, you know, ethically, you know, if I know that, if I kill, this is what the example that's given in the Bodhisattva scripture, Buddha in a past life knew that by killing this person, he was going to save 500 people who this person was going to kill. So, uh, do I, is it the right thing? Is the Buddha saying that, well, I'm a monk, so I shouldn't do it? Or not even a monk, but, uh, you know, I'm a Buddhist. I have the vow not to kill. So it's very obvious. The Buddha said, don't kill. Well, is, the, is Buddhism therefore unethical? Because you say there's these questions of ethic, ethics and morality they become much more complicated. And maybe the ethical thing to do is to kill this person. So that's why, you know, it, it's said to be much harder, the Bodhisattva path. It's, it's very challenging because it says that sometimes there are cases where actually this is not the right thing to do. And if we want to achieve individual liberation, it's very clear this is what we have to do. But if we want to achieve enlightenment, that's something very different. Um, so yeah, maybe I can I can address that more when we talk in the afternoon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So maybe it's good we can have a break now, and then yeah. But if you have other questions, please save them also for and people on Zoom. Of course, you're welcome also to ask questions at any point. Maybe not right now, but save them for the afternoon. There might even be some in the chat. Yeah, I can't read the screen from here. No, those. Other no, questions. Okay. But okay. actually, people can unmute themselves. Okay. We'll yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah, in the afternoon, if you'd like, please please ask some questions. Um, and uh, what what's the next session? I don't even know. <laughs> one o'clock is Vajras, one to one forty five is Vajrasattva okay. practice, and then two to three thirty is the Bodhisattva. The okay, yeah. So well, at one to one forty five, there'll be Vajrasattva. Yeah, I think you can all see it on there. See so those of you on Zoom, you're welcome to attend, but of course, no, no, um, how do you say, not required to do so. And yeah, I, I was actually thinking originally I would attend, but probably because I need to rest my leg, <laughs> I won't be able to come to that. And it's better, I, the doctor said, to spend as much time uh, elevating it as possible. But I'll come back at two o'clock uh, for the, you know, the next talk, and you're welcome to you know, come here, one, for the practice. So thank you all very much. Maybe we just do a short dedication. We'll do more dedication in the afternoon. What's in here? What book do you have? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the short thing is 50, 57. Okay, yeah, we can do that. Somebody want to lead it or sure. do so? I can do that. Okay. Um, so yeah, usually we just chant this one in English. Okay. Great. Page uh, 57. So we'll just do this in the next the two verses. That's fine. We'll do those yep. two. Through this virtually I swear we have in gain go through the last day. Yes, Lord.